Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Richards, Technical Services Manager of the Managing General Agents Association. And on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing this afternoon. This is being delivered by ICSR on the subject of the FCA Business Plan and Strategy 2425, a look at the key points. I'd just like to run through a few housekeeping areas. First of all, please ensure your microphone and camera are turned off. And if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Time allowing, these will be asked and answered at the end of the event. But if we do run out of time, questions will be answered post-event. This presentation is accredited for CPD hours, if relevant to your ongoing professional development programme. The briefing is being recorded and a link to the recording will be issued post-event together with the slides and our feedback survey. Please take the time to complete our survey. It will take no longer than two minutes and allows us to deliver the best possible future events to our members. So as a recap, today's briefing is on the subject of the FCA business plan and strategy from 24 to 25, a look at the key points from ICSR. So let me introduce you to our presenter, who I'm sure you all already know, Kenneth Underhill. Kenneth has almost 30 years in the London insurance market and is the former general counsel of Chubb European Group, then ACE. Prior to that, Kenneth was a founding partner of the commercial and regulatory team at Reynolds Porter Chamberlain. Kenneth founded ICSR in 2017 and has led the firm through successive years of exponential growth, keep helping a wide range of insurance firms with the establishment, operation and remediation of their businesses. He leads a team of employees and consultants, ICSR's talent pool, at, that now exceeds 50 people. And Kenneth is ably assisted uh, this afternoon by Claire King, who's the Risk and Compliance Director at ICSR. Um, so I'd just like to add, just on the poll questions, there are going to be a couple of poll questions. Just rest assured they are anonymous. And uh, thanks so much, Kenneth. I'll pass across to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, if we could just uh, flick on to uh, slide three, please. Thank you. Right. So the agenda today, uh, we've had our welcome. We're then going to have a quick run through background. We're going to look at the plan itself. We're going to compare it with the previous plan. Uh, and uh, we're going to have some conclusions. And then uh, hopefully we will have left uh, plenty of time for questions because uh, this session always seems to, to have questions. So uh, that's what we're doing. But before we get on to that, we have our first uh, Zoom question. Um, oh no, we haven't. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Before we before we do that, we have to go through um, the uh, learning objectives so that everybody can get their CPI, uh, CPD. Um, so the objectives today are to explain any changes in approach to regulator, regulatory compliance being adopted by the FCA and the strategic objectives driving this change. Uh, list uh, the specific areas of focus for the FCA we'll be looking at in 20, 24, 25, and how firms should approach these. Uh, explain the impact for firms of any changes in approach to non-compliance being signaled by the FCA and list the expectations of firms arising from the continued focus on consumer duty, fair value, uh, highlighted by recent market communications and the actions already taken in relation to certain products. Okay, so uh, those are the objectives. I hope that we're able to achieve them for everybody. Uh, can we, thank you. Oh, one too far. Okay, uh, first question. We're going to ha have a couple of minutes to allow everybody to uh, complete this. Uh, based on your current understanding of the SCA uh, business plan, uh, to what extent do you feel that these plans will result in changes to planning within your firm's compliance team? It won't surprise you that this is not the first time we've asked this question, and we will probably at some point uh, be comparing the answers uh, later on to previous years. So please... Uh, submit your answers. We'll give everybody about a minute on that. Uh, Tim, I'm sorry, I can't see how we're getting on with uh, answering. I must confess uh, that so... the, the numbers aren't changing for me. So what I'll do Fine. is, so we've had about a minute now, so let me end the poll. I'll share it. And then okay. hopefully um, 
we'll get the answers. See some numbers. There we go. Expect change, but I don't know what that will look like yet. Well, hopefully we'll be able to answer that for you today. Uh, don't expect any real change. Interesting. Uh, we've already discussed what changes we will be making. Very well done, those. Uh, and then I don't know is 12, which is fine. Uh, probably why you've joined the call. Um, good. Okay, that's great. That's probably, I think, uh, more people, and I'm, my memory will not serve me well on this, and I'm sure that somebody will correct me. as They usually do when I'm wrong, which is a good thing. Um, but I, I think that's probably more people in the um, we expect change but don't know what than in previous years. So interesting. Very good. Okay, let's move on, please. Okay, so this is, I think, our fifth or sixth year of doing these. It may, it may be more, it may be less. Um, but uh, what used to happen was every year there was an annual plan, and that was it. And it changed considerably every year. Uh, so what happened was Nicol Rithi, Nicol Rathi uh, came in as the new head of the FCA, and he decided that there needed to be a, a uh, strategy. So he created a strategy for the FCA. It was a three-year strategy, and this is the third one. Um, interestingly, uh, when the uh, strategy was first uh, issued, um, the first year, 2022, Nicol Rathi, you couldn't read the plan or the strategy documents without seeing Nicol's face numerous times. Uh, this time, we don't see him at all. Um, or, or, and in fact, you barely even see any quotes from him. So um, it, it's quite a change now uh, for, for this. Um, I think he sees this in some way as business as usual. People know who he is. He was uh, fairly new in 2022. Um, and I think he has made uh, his point about where he wants the FCA to be, um, something that we'll probably come back to uh, a few times. Um, in the period, uh, during the last three years, during Nichols' period uh, as chief, uh, there's been quite significant growth. Um, and in actual fact, since the FCA started, the growth in the number of people at the FCA is about a multiple of two to two and a half times. In the last year alone, the plan, or, or this year rather, the plan is to increase by, by more than 10% again. And the budget for the FCA itself is more than 10%. Um, so there's quite significant growth going on. Um, and some of these uh, will be picked up in, in this discussion, um, the reasons for them. Uh, uh, one of them most, most um, importantly is technology um, and some of the issues that the FCA is having to deal with. Um, an important point about this, you can see it in the last box on this slide, an important point is that the plan or the, and the strategy, the, the year three of the strategy, starts with a reminder of the environmental uh, and economical background to the plan. And, and it points out, you know, that high interest rates remain, although we know that they're likely to come down soon. They are still quite high. Um, there's also significant financial, uh, global financial risks and we we have uh, at the moment, um, in fact, it seems to be quite common uh, over the last five years or more, uh, considerable geopolitical risks. The first two of those, the high interest rates, the the global financial risks, uh, they drive uh, they drive uh, uncertainty uh, and uh, uh, difficult times for both firms uh, and for consumers and customers. Uh, so, so that's the background to this plan, and it's and it's important to bear that in mind throughout. Um, but having said that, uh, we also need to recognise that uh, in the past year, and certainly in the past month or two, as in the insurance sector, as insurers uh, declare their profits, we are seeing some pretty significant profits, um, and and the fact that the background of consumers and, and, and other customers are struggling uh, while the insurers are making quite significant profits. That drives uh, both a dynamic and an agenda in some ways to some of the issues that the FCA looks at and how it deals with those. So, so that's the background to what's going on. Um, if we then look at a very high level at the focus uh, for this year, you see there's protecting customers, there's ensuring market integrity, um, 
There's a promoting effective competition. That's between firms. And then you have competitiveness. That's more about international competitive competitiveness. Um, there's no real change in those. That's part of the plan. It's part of the original strategy. But most importantly, they are directly aligned to the, the statutory ob objectives of uh, the FCA. So, so there's no, nothing surprising um, about any of that at all. Um, if we could move on, please. Um, now, this isn't, there's no real depth uh, around this particular slide in, in the plan itself, um, but I think it's absolutely uh, something that we have to highlight. Um, it's not an objective, um, it's not a commitment by the FCA, um, but 86%, so that's a fairly significant percentage of the FCA's capital spend this year is going to be on technology. And for anybody who has uh, heard me before, seen me before talk about where the FCA is, I'm certainly last year's plan, certainly a few of the, uh, a few of the other briefings that we've done uh, during the past year, we, they all talk about the, the, the FCA's use, increasing use of technology, it's increasing use and access to AI, and its ability to uh, source data, uh, which it can use uh, in a way that, that drives more efficiency and better outcomes. So, so four key data sources that they receive information from, uh, the Financial Lives Survey, uh, the FCA Practitioner uh, Panel Survey, uh, Panel Survey, and in fact, the panel itself, um, the Ombudsman Service and the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. Um, so, so the they are, it, some of those are partners that the FCA works with. They all provide MI and data that the FCA can use. Um, you'll note, importantly, Financial Life Survey, uh, that is a focus on consumers. Uh, FCA practice, practice, and Practitioner Panel Survey, that's focused on consumers and customers. Uh, ombudsman Service, the sort of information that they get there are complaints and issues. Uh, again, customer focused. The financial services compensation scheme, that is uh, really about firms and their resilience, um, financial resilience. So you can see the balance there. It's about customers. It's about helping customers. It's about identifying issues. But it's also there's an element of, of resilience there. Now, the other point about this is there's another area that, that, that the FCA is getting its data from, and it's using that data uh, and the MI that it receives from firms reporting, uh, they drill down into that. They've now got very good methods for reviewing it uh, and, uh, and using uh, AI and other technology uh, to, to, to identify outliers. Uh, and that is a theme that we've talked, that's the theme that we've spent an awful lot of time talking about um, because it means that they are much more efficient. It means that if you've got tens of thousands of regulated entities, having that data come through and then having the ability to analyze that data very efficiently means that they can now identify much more efficiently and much more effectively um, outliers. And that might be outliers in products, it might be outliers in distribution, um, it might be outliers in firms in terms of the way that they deal with things. Excuse me a moment. But one of one of the probably the most obvious one, and it's certainly the one everybody, probably everybody on this call has had to deal with, is fair value. So everybody is now um, providing their fair value information. The FCA then um, compiles that and it produces data, but it's also using that data uh, to identify those products uh, and and risk prioritizing those products that it wants to deal with. Uh, and you know the best example of how it then responds uh, is gap insurance. Um, they identified that they had a concern. They went to the insurers uh, and and manufacturers, and they and they decided that they needed to act. So this really is is a key thing that I want everybody to remember. It it it, it is that the SCA is much smarter about what it's doing now, and it has much better tools. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, there's that, is it possible these days to hide from them? Um, 
it's getting it's getting less and less easy to do so. It's getting less and less easy if you are if you are uh, an outlier. Um, and so that's a that's the key piece that I wanted to bring across here. If we can move on to the next slide, we're now going to actually go and look at the plan's commitments. Um, these are all of the commitments that are made in this year's plan. Uh, the top three I am going to uh, focus on and talk about uh, reducing and preventing financial crime, putting consumers' needs first. There it is, smack in the middle there. Uh, and strengthening the UK's position in global wholesale markets. They're the three main ones. The third one, the, the, the position in the wholesale markets, is primarily a banking issue, but we'll, we'll, we'll come and talk about that later. Um, and then when I've dealt with those three, I, I will then hand over to Claire, who will, who will um, deal with the, the more detail on the others. So if we could move on to uh, the first of those, please. Right, um, subtle shift here, um, an interesting shift that if you look at the documents without reference to earlier years or other documentation, you, you might not identify, but this is really now number one for the FCA. Um, there may be those in the insurance market who feel that, uh, that consumer duty and, and fair value is still number one. It certainly feels that way for, for most firms, um, but, but the reducing and preventing financial crime is number one. Um, there is an element to which this is much more of a banking and financial uh, and and financial institutions issue rather than uh, for for insurance. But don't don't uh, don't think that that means that insurance is not in the in the limelight here as well. Um, and the issue, the reason that this is such an issue is because the the FCA are fighting what I'd describe as a sort of tough battle here. Um, Criminals who are who are money laundering, um, who are uh, involved in investment fraud, uh, involved in push payments uh, fraud cases. You know, the the click on a link and you're in trouble. Your your laptop's taken over, etc. Uh, before you know it, you can't get to your bank accounts, or you know, you have somebody calling you up and and telling you they're the bank, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I mean, that stuff. The 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 criminals who are operating in this sector. Um, they seem to have the upper hand at the moment. The, the reason that they have that upper hand is because they 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 tend to be ahead of the curve in technology, um, and that's why uh, so much time is being um, is being spent and so much money is being spent by the FCA. I'm focusing on this because the the outcome for customers uh, is so severe. I mean, you can lose all your money uh, on the on these sort of schemes. Um, so, so if we look at the desired outcomes, you will see uh, there is uh, a, an outcome of lowering the incidence of money laundering. That, that I think that's achievable. I, I, I'm not sure whether they're there yet, but but the, the one, the two that I want you to look at are slow the growth in investment fraud, slow the growth in authorized push payments, and and that's because. The criminals are ahead of the curve in technology. It's because the um, the ability to create these technical, you know, the technology tools that they're using is so simple that that criminals in this space are proliferating. So, so the FCA doesn't believe that it's going to lower the incidence. It's just trying to slow the growth at this point in time. And I think that speaks volumes of the level of issues that, that the FCA are having to deal with. Um, you know, they are not helped by things like the dark web or cryptocurrencies where, you know, financial transactions take, take place uh, away from prying eyes. Um, and we know that, you know, the, 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 the spy networks have access to them, but I, I, I don't know at this stage whether or not the FCA itself has access to any of those. Um, but you would hope that it was getting some a benefit and support from the uh, uh, from the agencies. Um, so um, they want to strengthen supervision of firms, sanction systems and controls, again, primarily around the banking. Um, but if you don't have the right sanction systems, you know, you're 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 going to find yourself under a spotlight at some point. Um, pro uh, proactive assessments of any money laundering, banking generally, uh, disrupt and pursue, sanction those committing and enabling financial crime, 
um, difficult to do, extremely difficult to do, um, because most of them are offshore. Um, very hard to, to do anything about that. Um, but uh, on improving capabilities to identify request platforms on, on financial promotions, they now have the tools that allow them to identify uh, platforms which are uh, not, uh, or, uh, which are issuing unauthorized financial promotions. Um, and, and they are using those platforms to, to considerable effect. Uh, many of you, I assume, get the weekly uh, emails from the FCA. Uh, and, um, you know, you will see generally on a Friday afternoon, uh, if you're still logged on, that there are five or 10 firms uh, every week that they are catching up with, um, which is an improvement because, you know, I don't think they were hitting those sort of numbers previously. Right, next, please. Okay, so we all know what this is. Putting customers first, uh, customers' needs first uh, is, uh, you know, in, 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 in the insurance space is all about consumer duty. It's all about, um, uh, uh, fair value, product governance, and the like. Uh, and the first, uh, uh, just on the first of the two desired outcomes, there's, there's, uh, I've been in this market long enough now to, to, to see a, a sort of trend here, which, which I don't know whether a lot of people have seen. But if you go into a firm now, um, what you will see is that the younger generation are coming from a point of view of they get it. TCF has been around since the mid-noughties, I think 2005, maybe 2004, but, but it's been around a long time. The whole approach to treating customers first and, and, and putting them on a pedestal has been around a long, long time. And you now, if you go into a firm, the firm may be failing in all sorts of other ways, but you will find that the people at the, the coal face are now in middle management and sometimes in senior management you know they've they've come through, and and that that mantra, that FCA mantra, or it was originally an FSA mantra of treat your customers first, is starting to really take hold at all levels of organisations. Um, so I think the first two of these outcomes you can see much better, and you can feel it much better. People get it because they've lived it ever since they've been in the market. Um, fair value, well, you know. <laughs> That is going to remain one of the most difficult uh, elements for London market. Um, less so, I think, for the uh, UK market, retail UK retail market, because the firms don't have complex distribution chains. But in the London market, the complex distribution chains make it very, very difficult. Um, and what we have seen is that firms are not taking up the opportunity to use technology which can assist. Um, so most firms continue to deal with fair value manually. And until, uh, you know, the solutions that are available are taken up and used, I think it's going to remain complex and, and, dif and, and difficult. Um, if we move on to, uh, um, we know what custom, good customer service, we're going to see that it's going to continue. I, I think Claire will probably pick up on this again. I will certainly come back to it, but there is going to be a look at uh, the question of, um, you know, the service the customers get. And this is really where that dynamic comes in. Insurers are making very good profits at the moment, but the service that customers are receiving on the claim side is not improving. It might, it might not, but we are going to see some work on that. Um, and and uh, I think that that's, you know, we'll, we'll We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, combining insights on customers' needs. So, so that's what I've talked about already. I mean, that, that use of uh, partner data uh, really is leading to effective results. I think that this is a continued activity. They're going to continue looking at it. They're going to continue pushing um, um, their agenda through uh, the reporting that everybody is doing. Uh, through the MI that they are issuing to the to to the market, saying, "Look, you know, it's very obvious from these uh, fair value um, uh, uh, details that we are issuing which of these products is not where it needs to be," uh, and they are leaving it to firms to sort themselves out. But if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, do it, you know what's going to happen. 
Um, so I think that's what I wanted to talk about on this page. You can see there is uh, a, a quote from Nickel. Um, it wasn't actually a part of his plan. It was a quote that he issued uh, quite recently with the Dear CEO letters uh, and other letters. Um, uh, you know, he, he believes that the firms that are operating consumer duty uh, will have a competitive edge. Uh, and the reason for that is that customers uh, will be uh, sticky, right? The better you treat your customers, the better the service that they get, the more likely it is outside of a cost element that they will stay with you. Um, and that's the point that he is making. All right. Can we please go on to uh, the next page, which I think is my last one for a while, a little while at least. Um, so strengthening the UK position, uh, the global wholesale market, again, this is a major bank thing. Um, the banks have uh, had difficulties um, uh, competing against uh, global banks, against overseas banks. Uh, Brexit has has uh, certainly changed the uh, changed the environment for everybody, um, but that isn't to say that this is not uh, an insurance issue. Um, the London market um, is, I think, well, it, it still is the the most important uh, property and casualty uh, market in the globe, um, and it is one of the most significant. Um, uh, um, uh, contributors to the UK economy. So, so the regulators, the the Bank of England, the 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 FCA, the Treasury, the government, they want uh, to strengthen and continue to strengthen uh, the UK's position because of the contribution to the coffers. Surprisingly enough, um, yeah. So, uh, what have we got here? We've got. On the on the first one, the framework is clear, well uh, well understood and trusted by all. I, I think that's that that's a bit of a mixed bag. I, I think that that uh, certainly for the larger firms, there is no doubt about uh, you know what the regulatory framework is, how it works, uh, and and is trusted. I think uh, maybe for some of the smaller firms, that's less less the case. Um, the other one I wanted to look at was market participants regard the regulatory framework as, as proportionate in terms of speed and cost. Um, I, I, I just wonder whether that's true. Um, I think there is uh, the firms have a public persona and a private view um, still, uh, even uh, despite what I said about, you know, the, the, the new generations coming through and understanding the need to look after customers. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they believe that the approach adopted by uh, the FCA uh, is proportionate. Um, yeah, so if we if we look at the activities that they're going to continue with here, we know that they are um, they're looking here at their own performance. They're wanting to make sure that as a regulator, people can become uh, regulated here, can move into the market here efficiently and effectively. Uh, and I think they've still got a bit of a way to go, but they they have come a long, long way uh, from where they were during Brexit, which was frankly a disaster for the FCA. They were inundated with applications. Um, they struggled to deal with them. They lost a huge number of people. Uh, they had people dealing with insurance applications who came from um, uh, from from the investment sector. They didn't understand the business models. Now they've got people who understand what they're supposed to do, and we are seeing a much quicker turnaround. A quicker turnaround on, on applications is, is good for business. The quicker that people can get in and get going, um, the better it will be for the market. Right, Claire, can I please hand over to you? Thanks, Kenneth, and uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, I will talk through the remaining commitments in the 24-25 plan um, from the FCA. Uh, so the first one on this slide is the preparing financial services for the future. And I think this is sort of an extension from what Kenneth has already described in, in uh, the third commitment and really um, plays out the Somsi uh, UK reforms 
um, the secondary objective from the government on uh, for the PRA and the FCA to create a more competitive um, environment for, for UK firms. So I think this very much speaks to that. Um, so they note the implementation of the Treasury Future Regulatory Framework, which is more snappily titled Smarter Regulatory Framework now. Um, the I think one, one thing to note on this particular point is the um, this budget item for the FCA is the largest of all of them. Uh, so around 11 million they've, they've budgeted um, to, to meet this commitment, which is um, uh, twice that of the consumer duty budget item, which is around 5 million. Um, and the second item, I think that's kind of just that demonstrates that the level of commitment they are putting towards this, um, this piece. Um, they are looking at repealing um, EU laws where appropriate and replacing them. And they've actually already done this um, around the IDD rules. So they've repealed the EU regs on that and replaced them. They have replaced them like for like. So the wording is the same at the moment, but they note um, specifically for the London market, that they want to review those to make sure they continue to be appropriate uh, and, and you know suit the UK market. So I think already some action on that um, and already a, a watch this space item on that too, to uh, make sure the uh, UK market is working um, as efficiently as, as possible. Uh, the next commitment uh, deals with um, problem firms, uh, looking at uh, dealing with problem firms. And this is that kind of um, returning of the theme around data um, and using, using it more effectively for, for um, assessing the market. So I think it's in a speech in 2022, um, the FCA said it wants to be as much sort of a, a data regulator as it is a, a financial one. And this is playing out. So it, it's, um, as Kenneth mentioned, the, the, the use of um, auto detection capabilities to, to identify problem firms and individuals and address them um, as quickly as possible. They also want to make sure that there are no barriers within its own regulatory framework to, to, that would you know, constrain them being able to do this. Uh, commitment six is related to market abuse and not directly um, relevant to, to the insurance firms. Commitment seven looks at reducing harm um, from firm failure. So again, that kind of data piece, um, I'm just not looking at my notes because I wanted to say, yeah, so the FCA have sort of recognised um, that the, the insolvencies, um, you know, will persist in 2024. So they want to make sure that they're on top of um, identifying um, firms that are at risk of failure or, you know, having issues with, with financial resilience. And again, that data piece, there is a new financial uh, resilience return that was introduced in uh, January this year, this year that will require um, firms to um, provide information on a quarterly basis. So much more frequent um, than in previous um, uh, times when the, the requirements were, sorry, the, the requests were much more on an ad hoc basis. Um, so again, that should give the FCA much more data, much better view of, of the financial resilience um, of the market. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Tim. Um, commitment eight relates to um, the FCA's ESG um, priorities. So they know they will be integrating their sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels um, across the market. And there'll be a new anti-greenwashing rule in that that moves them forward, that's a much more transparent and trustworthy um, uh, sort of investment um, reporting basis. So that, that's a significant shift forward. And they also note um, that they want to uh, start uh, uh, looking at the, the nature piece around, around um, climate change. So companies will be already um, getting to grips with reporting on TCFD, which is looking at the financial related risks around, cl around climate change. Uh, TNFD is looking at how companies' activities um, impacts nature. 
um, and the ecosystem. So that's clearly something that the FCA wants to, to engage on and make sure um, as a market we're, we're moving forward on that piece as well. Um, commitment nine relates to um, shaping digital markets to achieve good outcomes. Again, it's the same theme. It's looking at um, AI, um, assessing the impact of AI on, on consumers, sort of a new area that, that the FCA is getting to grips with and understanding. And they created a, a call for um, inputs on data asymmetry between big tech firms and other financial firms in the sector uh, last year. Um, so we're expecting a publication on, on the results of that at some point in the second quarter um, of this year to sort of understand the differences between how data is being, being um, collated and used in um, big tech firms and, 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 and the insurance industry. And then they've also noted um, the use of sludge practices. So understanding how um, firms are using them, which is where perhaps if you're on an app and it's, it's suggesting that you create put add-ons um, into, your, into your coverage or you're trying to cancel a product and it's very it's just not easy to navigate to find where how you cancel that. So their sludge practices, they are trying to make sure that um, consumer journeys kind of don't have those to worry about. That's already something that's been uh, or certainly should be considered as part of the consumer duty um, requirements that firms are looking at. So I think sludge and nudge is, is the, the, the practice that they want to make sure is eradicated. So that's another thing that the, the FCA is, is concerned to, to address. Uh, the next commitment relates to um, their redress framework, and, and Kenneth's already spoken to this um, in previous slides around the work with the FOS and the FSCS um, and how they bring their, uh, their information together as part of the wider implications framework and make sure that um, consumers are being, being cared for as as best possible. They note their continued work with the uh, claims management company sector and also um, continued work on the discretionary commission arrangements in the motor finance market. And that's where brokers were incentivized to increase interest rates on motor finance products um, for, for customers. That practice was banned in 2021. Um, but there have been claims made against um, those companies pre the ban that has been argued by the market that it was a legitimate um, practice at that point and, and they're sure and therefore shouldn't um, be subject to claim. However, there have been a couple of successful claims um, uh, awarded. So there's been a pause on the deadline to address this. So that's something that the, the FCA is, is concerned to um, make sure they manage also and see if it's actually a kind of a, a body of, of claims that, well, they're expecting a body of claims to come through um, and, and understand whether there has been sort of uh, a serious issue around that matter in the market. Uh, commitment 11 looks at enabling consumers to help themselves in the context of, of financial promotions. And I think, you know, they rec the FSA recognises, you know, the ongoing um, challenging economic environment and also in uh, at the same time how much more accessible consumers are digitally to consumers um, and being impacted by financial promotions. So the FCA is concerned to, to see that firms are uh, robustly assessing the, their financial promotions approval processes. Um, anecdotally, we, we've spoken with, with clients that are trying to, to deal with this. Um, and given, uh, depending on the complexity of the distribution chain, that can be problematic. It can be difficult to really understand who's involved and where. And as a manufacturer signing off on those um, financial promotions, it's obviously key that they get that, that call right. Um, so that's something that we know firms are, you know, are trying to um, address as best possible. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. The next commitment relates to um, operational um, disruptions and minimizing the impact of them. Um, as a market, it, we've been working towards um, achieving operational resilience via the framework, uh, the directive, 
um, from 2021, 20, 22, um, and that requirement needs to be in place by uh, end of March next year. So that requires firms to have uh, their important business services in place, um, have impact tolerances um, assigned against each of those, and for the firm to be able to demonstrate that intolerable harm, you know, will not be um, uh, put onto consumers um, should any disruption occur. Uh, off the back of that, the, the FCA have noted that they also intend to create a, a publish a consultation paper on how they expect firms to um, report operational incidents. Um, so we can expect that coming down the line. And they've also noted here um, that they, they intend to uh, create new rules to address um, critical third party systemic risk um, in, the, in the sector. They, along with the PRA, issued a joint consultation paper in de December last year. Uh, the consultation closed in March. Um, so we can expect there to be a follow up from that um, related to how critical third parties um, uh, are both manage themselves and are overseen um, by the market. And that, according to the consultation paper, looks like it will have very similar requirements as the um, the operators ones do on, on, uh, on carriers now. Um, and then the last one relates to um, improving oversight um, of ARs. So you know, a really sort of key area, new, new guidance coming out in um, December 2022 on that. Again, the data theme, um, the, the FCA will be using that to, to really scrutinize how um, ARs are overseen by their principles. Um, so Matt Brewer, I think, said that he has three areas of concern around principles of oversight of, of their ARs, and that's relating to appropriate resources, having, having enough in place to do that oversight work, um, the uh, lines of business being written outside, ARs writing lines of business outside of the principles um, lines. So how can they oversee that appropriately? Um, and then the third one, which I always forget, is the AR being significantly larger than the principal and that creating um, some, some challenges. So there are key areas of scrutiny around ARs. Um, and the, there has already been in 2023, um, there are, I think, seven principals have been put on watch regarding um, concerns over their management of, of their ARs. So that already being played out and being and being seen as um uh action uh by the fca um next slide please tim i think that's all the all the commitments so yeah so just this this final slide um just an overview of the timelines for the new and ongoing activities um uh, de uh detailed in the plan so we know the consumer duty um closed book um, reviews should have been completed or should be completed by by July this year. So, an assessment of the of the outcomes in the directive on on your closed book should have been conducted. Uh, board reports created and and with your board full sign off ahead of that um, deadline of at the end of July. Um, and that big tech call um, uh, uh, I noted earlier, we're expecting the the um, the results of that at some point in Q2. Q3, again, kind of um, sort of talked to those at the beginning of, of the slides. So some publications around the financial live survey, the practitioners panel annual report, and uh, the next step being published on that uh, dis discretionary commissions arrangement piece um, on, those, on those motor products. And then in the second half of of the year, we're expecting to see that um, instant reporting CP coming out from, from the FCA. And then a couple of bits that we're slightly unclear on in terms of timeframes around further um, consultations on CTPs, and then also related to claims handling and vulnerable, vulnerable customers. Um, I will now hand back to Kenneth to go through the um, differences between the two plans. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Claire.
Uh, let us do that then, shall we? Um, can we, oh, there we go, it's up. So, so if we look at 2023 to 24, 2024, 25, uh, if you look at uh, the first point, there's there, uh, better use of data. It's not in this year's. Uh, and it's not in there because uh, they've taken a slightly higher level look at this. Um, I mean, then they're going to obviously go into detail, but their, their approach is we need to look at this. It's just continued. It's going to be heightened. Um, but they are already using, they already have a better use of data. Um, so they have, they've put that in place. Uh, and now they're using that to focus close, more closely on firms that they think need to be looked at. They're the higher risk firms in terms of their processes. Customer needs first. Um, interestingly, uh, there are three bullet points here. The, the others have two. Um, it's it's not a definitive, but it does tell you that there are more um, initiatives uh, on customers' needs first uh, than there are in other areas. Uh, some are much more focused initiatives. Customer needs first. There are a lot of initiatives that are going on and those are going to carry forward. Uh, we, we know consumer duty is not going away, it's only just turned up um, and they are not satisfied. We know from the letters that were issued in, in March, um, or was it March, February, um, that uh, there's a lot more work to be done. So, so that's a, a, for, for insurance as well, it's probably the main space. If you're in consumer insurance, um, this is the piece that is going to take your life this year if it didn't take it last year and the year before that and the year before that. Um, dealing with problem firms, uh, more focus, increased use of data. So here uh, they have previously said that there was going to be more focus on taking action. Now they're talking about the use of data. We know that they're building the data stats. We know that they're asking for the information that will lead to the swifter action that they say that they want to uh, get to. Um, the same applies on evaluating the regulatory perim perimeter. Um, they hope that what they are now doing and the way that they are approaching reporting from firms will lead them to get a better understanding of where uh, firms may be trading on the verges or and or outside of the regulatory perimeter. Um, that will then lead them to look at, as they have with appointed, um, appointed representatives, that's um, th that that will lead them to consider whether or not they need to take action uh, in relation to those uh, firms and areas. Improving redress, uh, Claire talked about this. Um, they want to continue to work closely with FOS and the Financial Services Compensation Scheme uh, to identify uh, issues and ensure that redress is available uh, and ensure that it's at the right level. Uh, harm from firm failure. Uh, more use of data to look at at-risk at firms, um, best practice uh, focus on wind-down firms, uh, wind-down plans. Um, this has been a big issue in the insurance sector, the, in the, sorry, in the insurer area. Um, they, they, they start from that point of view. Um, the loss of a breaking firm tends to uh, lead to less issues. Uh, than the loss of an insurer. That's not always the case, but but so the wind down wind down plans are more advanced on the insurer side than on the FC on the on the broking and the MGA side at the moment. Uh, improved oversight of ARs. We've just talked about that. Claire did a good job of that. They're going to test them. They're going to check them. They're going to continue to ensure that they're in the right place. I, I don't think they're going to do anything further at the moment. I saw there was a, 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 a question about that earlier. Um, I, I, they may take further steps, but I think they want to settle with where they've got to. They've identified firms that they're concerned about. They've sort of given them a bit of a shot across the bows, and I think they want to see where they go from there. Um, but but I'm, I don't think that's a, that's a closed space. I do believe that there will be more to come um, at some point. And then operational resilience. It's... It's so critical now um, because there is such a reliance on technology. That this is just going to increase. Um, in some ways, you know, uh, tech, technological resilience, operational resilience, is probably as important as financial resilience because firms uh, can suffer from a, technolo a technological failure much quicker 
uh, generally than they would from a financial failure. And there is uh, no warning signs uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a resilience failure uh, when a firm has been attacked um, by a cyber attack. Um, whereas you can at least see some warning signs uh, for firms on the financial side. So, so that's where the differences are. Um, a lot of this is we, we've put the right things in place. We've got the technology there. Now we want to focus on it. Uh, some of it is, yes, we've got further work to do. Some of it is we want to see where people are with what we've put in place. Um, but that's, that's the real part. This is the third of the strategy, third year of the strategy. Uh, and I, I sort of get where they've got to. I'm not sure that they've got as much done as they wanted to. Um, we have seen consultation papers being pushed back from their uh, original dates and things. Um, so they may not have quite got to where they want to be. But I do think that in terms of the strategy, they will have delivered a considerable portion of it by the end of 2025. Okay, um, that is it. Can we go to the next question, please? Right, let's uh, have a minute or two. Uh, we've got time. We're doing all right here for time uh, for questions at the end, but let's get everybody to answer this one quickly so that we can have those questions. That's 30 seconds, Kenneth. I think I'll lead a bit up to about 45, if that's all right with you. Sounds good. Yep. yep. Again, I can't see the numbers coming in. No, I don't know why. We used to be able to see the numbers. The same with me. I'm not quite sure what's happened, so we'll have to look into that. But uh, I'll end the poll there and share it. About the same. Okay. I think that's fair enough. Um, because I, I truly don't believe that much has changed. I mean, there's been a bit more focus here and a bit less there. There's more technology, but, but you know, it, it is what it is. Um, so about the same seems about right, more positive. Um, I suspect that means more positive because there's not as much significant new legislation coming through. If that's true, or not, not new legislation, but new rules and new, uh, new policy statements. Uh, that is true, but um, I think the issue here is that a lot of this is going to be about have you done the right thing in implementing uh, what we have brought in? Um, so, you know, if you're comfortable that you've done the right, got it all in place and it's working properly, then that's a good place to be. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please, Tim. Right, conclusion. I think I sort of summarized a lot of this earlier on. Um, you, you know, the, the, the point is that uh, there is a lot more about getting the job done um, than starting something new. Um, they are going to be testing firms. They want to check that you've done what you needed to do, uh, particularly around, uh, well, I know it mentions AML, but I'm, I would focus much more closely on consumer duty and fair value. Um, I think AML, most people have the right right things in place because it's been ongoing for a while. There's not been significant changes. Yes, there have been new sanctions in Russia. And yes, we're seeing new sanctions in other countries. But, but actually, your sanctions framework should be there because the issues in Ukraine have been going on for a while. So I, I don't think that's a lot new there. Um, detail uh, around Brexit, even though it's the largest individual issue on budget uh, in terms of expense. Um, I think this is more, and there is no clarity, but I suspect from what we've seen that this is about embedding the firms that have been given branch licenses um, and making sure that the changes to the legislation um, that they want to bring in to take us <clears throat> away from uh, the IDD uh, continue. So, so that's where I'm, I'm sort of thinking that lives. Um, AI technology... I can't under I can't overstate the importance of what's what's coming and what's happening in that work in that area. Uh, claims um, I've already talked about that. You know the big issue there is firms are making a lot of money 
uh, and a lot of individuals feel that uh, the service that they are receiving on claims is not improving. Um, so that's a watch this space very closely. One of the dynamics on that, another dynamic is I think that some of the work that may be done on claims and getting information in relation to claims may highlight some differences between uh, third party uh, claims providers, uh, third party providers to insurers rather on claims handling and where 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 um, MGAs or uh, or insurers handle the claims themselves. Um, so that might be quite an interesting dynamic and it may lead to some adjustments in the market in relation to outsourcing of claims, um, but you don't know. Um, increasing use of data, I've, I've, I've said it, I've said it and I'll continue to say it for another year. The, the FCA is getting better at finding, uh, finding where people are hiding in the corner. Um, so it's just not where you want to be. And then principals working with ARs, um, you know, there is more work there. They are looking more closely. I, didn't, I, I said earlier uh, that I didn't expect a lot more to come at this stage. There's a bit of a settling, but that settling is about settling the rules and things, not about whether or not they are going to stop looking closely to see whether or not principals are doing what they should be doing in relation to appointed reps. I mean, they will, they will carry that forward. It was a very high risk. Uh, it has uh, the significantly high proportions of complaints uh, come in relation to AR business. Um, and, and that has not gone down at this point in relation, to, you know, since the work they did last year. Um, there's not going to be a settling period. They want to make sure that people have done what they needed to in relation to the new requirements last year. Uh, and then they would like to see a tail off of the, of the high complaints. Right, you've got some useful links there. Uh, these slides will be available, so you'll get the links to um, all of those documents. Uh, I now need to take you very quickly because I do want to leave a few minutes for, for, for questions. Learning objectives, I have to take you through these. Explain any changes in pro approach to regulatory compliance. The list specific areas of focus the FCA will be looking at. Explain the impact for firms of any changes in approach. Uh, list FCA expectations of firms arising from consumer duty, fair value, et cetera. Um, I hope that we've covered those. Um, it is only an hour, so it's quite hard to get through it, but um, I think we've tried to, and I'm, I'm hoping we have. So questions. Um, okay. Tim. Yeah, Kenneth, we've got a few in uh, by the chat, so uh, I'll try and Ooh. rattle through these as quickly as I can. So um, the first one, what's the most common failings in fair value by firms? Is it mainly claims for claims performance or is it price or covers? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I did read that while um, and I'm not sure I I think it's fail. If you said failings in consumer duty, then I would say it was on the claim side. Um, but if you're saying failures in fair value, it's very difficult to to give a fair value assessment of of the claim service. Um, so I think I would say overall, uh, failings in fair value are about price because that's what fair value is about. Although they don't say it's a it's not a pricing regulation, they want the value to be there. I think the the if you looked at consumer duty, however, um, the dynamic is. Most people complain after their claim hasn't been paid, so you would have to say it is a claim-related complaint. Uh, um, so that's, I think, the only way I can answer that, really. Okay, and the next question is, uh, do you envisage that the FCA will impose further restrictions on principles appointing ARs in the future, and what might we expect to see? So, so one of the areas that I think concerns the FCA uh, is a Brexit-related area where uh, UK firms have appointed um, as an appointed representative a firm in the EU uh, so that that firm didn't have to apply for a branch licence. I think that is well and truly in the grey area of what might be uh, the um, perimeter uh, of the FCA perimeter. So I, I would be um, surprised if they didn't deal with that. Um, and that does actually require a legislative change. And that's why I think there is some more legislation still to come. That's probably the area that I 
think of when it comes to perimeter guidance and ARs and, and their principles. Um, I also do think that if uh, complaints don't come down, then we will see uh, some more focus on um, uh, how principals oversee their ARs. So yes, I think complaints need to come down. Okay, and um, we're just about out of time, but I'll see if I can quickly rattle through these two. Um, so uh, regarding AR, it is ridiculous that the principal needs to be in the same lines. Who would give AR to a competitor? Uh, agreed. Agreed. I, under I fully understand that dynamic. I, I think the issue, however, is that uh, a principal must have the ability to oversee um, what uh, its, its appointed representatives are doing. And that includes the value of a, a product and whether or not it's hitting target markets and the like. And I, I, that's why I think that they, they are expecting it because this is, about, uh, this is about a principle helping a new firm into the market. So it's a very big entrant uh, process. Uh, lots of young firms want to get into the market um, and they need that principle to do it cheaply, to be able to get on with it. But, but the principle has to be able to oversee them. And if they don't understand their product at all, you can sort of understand why the, 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 the FCA would be uh, concerned. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure I consider it to be outrageous. It is about protecting uh, the reputation of the market, making sure that the products are being distributed are suitable for uh, customers and, and the like. And you can't do that if you don't know what the product, if you don't know the product, I don't think. Okay, so, um, sorry, Kenny. Uh, final question. How do you expect the FCA to react to firms appointing ARs, ARs for the first time in 24-25? Uh, so we already know that they're asking more questions around uh, once the appointments are made or when the appointments are coming in. Um, I would expect that to continue. Um, I would expect um, there to be a focus on the governance side of it. Um, and I would expect that, you know, if you are going to become, if you're new, going to be a new principal, um, then you really need to, to make sure that you've got the right governance structures in place and the resources to, to operate that governance structure. That's the bit that concerns uh, uh, the, the, um, the FCA. The principal is basically lending or leasing its license to to a party that's not regulated and is outside or effectively outside the perimeter. Um, so there are concerns about that. The complaint levels are considerably higher than any other business, and and you know all of the all of the red flags are there for them. Great. Thanks, Kenneth. And we'll uh, wrap it up there as we are slightly over time. So uh, just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much, Kenneth, and uh, also to Claire for your uh, session today, which has been uh, really, really useful. So thanks for that. And just to say to everyone, you can reach Kenneth or Claire at the contact details you can see on screen now, or contact me at tim.richards at mgaa.co.uk with any questions or introductions. And I'll be happy to pass those on. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, don't forget to provide your feedback and look out for forthcoming MGAA events. I hope you have a productive afternoon, all of you. Thanks again for joining us, and I'll see you all soon.